right. Thank you so much, Dr. Sanders, and good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all tonight and um, uh, for this lecture entitled Egyptian Christological Identity. And before we get into that, um, I wanted to start off actually sharing a little bit more about myself, uh, more, uh, I think, kind of on a more important level, uh, which is my testimony, how I came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. That's actually my most important uh, thing that's ever happened to me in my life. So, I'd, And that really kind of sets up a lot of where I'm coming from with, uh, with this presentation, but also just kind of the things I do in uh, reading theology African. But, um, but yeah, I, I'm from St. Louis. I grew up in uh, the west side of St. Louis, Missouri, uh, in an urban uh, community. And, um, and I grew, I'm a biracial person, so my dad is black, my mom is white. And, uh, and I grew up in a very racially segregated city. St. Louis uh, is very, like, it's almost like cut in half. Like, there's a black and a white half to the city. And I lived on the black half, but not that far from the white half. And I actually grew up going to a church, a white church, on the white half. So I grew up in a black neighborhood, but I grew up going to a white church. And, uh, and so for me, growing up, Christianity was white because my church was my world, right? I don't know if anybody else can relate to that, but like when you're growing up, especially if you're a young Christian like me, uh, you know, I don't have one of those kind of, you know, I guess sometimes I feel like more exciting testimonies where I, you know, went off and did all this kind of stuff. I was just like, no, I got saved when I was like seven years old and my mom shared the gospel with me and I, I was very aware of my need for a savior and my sin. Uh, and, and I was uh, really elated, especially not having a father around that there was a heavenly father that came down and died for my sin so I could be re reconciled to him despite how bad I was, <laughs> uh, even as a seven-year-old. So I put my faith in Christ and started following him at a young age, and I had a passion for evangelism, and I'd be sharing the gospel. Um, but again, the place that I was being nurtured spiritually and trained up, which was a great and godly church, uh, didn't reflect the culture that I really more so connected with. Uh, and you know, um, and we, you know, we can get into like biracial identity, but that's a whole other kind of uh, can of worms. But read *The Color of Water*, James McBride. It's a great book. Um, but uh, suffice it to say that the church that I was growing up in is God. Godly and, 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 and loving as it was, it really uh, didn't connect with me culturally. Uh, and I didn't really feel like I was growing in terms of discipleship in a way that made sense in my community that I lived in and the culture that I was growing up in. So I always felt like there was a, a disconnect between my cultural identity and my identity as a Christian. And I always kind of felt like I had to pick one uh, or the other. And I actually almost, I, I, you know, again, I was growing up, uh, you know, and even I'm in LA now and I grew up as an LA wannabe because I grew up in the 90s when like NWA and Tupac and all that stuff was big. And so I, I grew up on all that you know, like throwing up West Side when I'm like from Missouri. Um, and, uh, and so that was the culture I grew up in, right? That, that was the, the, you know, and, and, and you know, to be sure, the kind of the urban culture, there is a lot of brokenness. There is a lot of sin in it. But, uh, and, and the funny thing is nobody ever sat me down and told me that my culture was wrong or sinful uh, or explained it to me or that it was incompatible with Christianity. But yet somehow I internalized that message, I think from lots of maybe indirect ways of that. And, and, and I kind of just put it all together, the good with the bad, and just kind of thought my culture altogether is just not good. So when I felt the Lord called me to ministry, I felt like I had to throw away my cultural identity, uh, you know, whether it was like, you know, the ur like just the, all of the urban culture, like whether it's like the way of talking, what, mannerisms or, or uh, music or, you know, again, the good with the bad. I felt like it all had to go and I had to assimilate to the culture of Christianity, which in my mindset was white because that's just all that I was exposed to. And so, um, and so I, you know, ended up going to a Christian college to study theology. And it was actually my first year there where the Lord really spoke to me, my freshman year in college where the Lord spoke to me. And the passage that he spoke to me through was in uh, Acts chapter 10, where God, the Holy Spirit, has spoken to this God-fearing Gentile named Cornelius. And he's actually the first Gentile to receive the Holy Spirit and to become a Christian in Scripture, which is the prophetic fulfillment of God's call on Abraham to be the father of a nation through whom all nations would be blessed. Um, and, and, and Pete, but Peter, you know, he, he didn't quite understand what's going on. God gave him this vision of this food and he said, kill and eat. But he said, no, no, I don't want to touch anything that's unclean. But God told him, do not call unclean what I've called clean. And Peter didn't yet understand that God was prepping him for the realization of this prophecy that through the Jews and through Christ that the Gentiles were going to be grafted in. And that, and then Peter has this aha moment when he meets Cornelius and says in verse 34, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts people from all people groups who fear him and do what is right. Um, and then it didn't stop there uh, because Peter then later, at the, uh, uh, along with Paul and Barnabas and others at, at, at the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, when they're having this struggle, the early church is having this struggle. Okay, now that, okay, we know that 
Gentiles can be Christians, right? We know that, that it's not only for Jews, and, and we've known that from the Old Testament. That's not a New Testament innovation, but it's been that God, that's been God's plan from the beginning to have a global plan of salvation, not only for the Jews. But uh, there was a question of, you know, how do they become Christian? And do they still need to be circumcised? Do they still need to kind of assimilate or uh, adhere to Jewish customs? And the Holy Spirit led the Council of Jerusalem to realize that, no, they don't have to be circumcised. They don't have to assimilate to Jewish culture in order to follow Jesus. They just have to have faith in Christ uh, and, and to be redeemed through the Holy Spirit by grace through faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that, you know, these other kind of cultural norms are not uh, and in fact, uh, God speaks to their culture as well. And when John uh, talks about Jesus being the logos, right, that the, the idea of a logos is actually a platonic uh, kind of Hellenistic philosophical term. It's not a Hebrew or, you know, Old Testament Jewish term. It didn't originate with the Hebrew people, but it's a, plat a philosophical term that God uses uh, and calls himself, calls Jesus, right, uh, the, you know, and uses this term to contextualize the gospel. And, 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 and that's what God's word calls us to continue to do, that God's word both embraces our culture and also transforms it at the same time. It's not one or the other, but it's both. And that all of our cultures are fallen, but all of our cultures are also beautiful and made in God's image, as all of us are made. And, and the Holy Spirit is working in and through all people groups um, and drawing all people unto himself through Christ. And so that, was, that, that really hit me really hard. And I, 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 those words uh, that, that God spoke to Peter, don't call unclean what I've called clean, uh, that, was really, uh, that really cut me to my core because I realized I was calling myself and my people unclean, which God has called clean and which he has redeemed through the blood of the Lamb. And so I was really, um, so I, I just, uh, you know, just ever since then I've had a strong burden for ministering to other people who uh, maybe struggle with a similar kind of thing. Just real quick, by a show of hands, like how many people in here, by a quick show of hands, have ever heard someone say something like, Christianity is the white man's religion? A few, okay, good number of people. Uh, and maybe you might have heard them say something like, Christianity is an American religion, or Christianity is a Western religion, or the moniker might change, right? But, but, but there's a, it seems pretty uh, common among a lot of us that, that it, there is a common association, a common belief, a perception, among people that Christianity belongs to a certain people group. So again, I, I thought it, and no one ever sat me down and told me that, but even as like a nine-year-old, I internalized it. I don't know if it was from seeing depictions of Augustine that looked like Santa Claus and not like a, a North African from Hippo, um, or seeing pictures of Jesus that looked like Captain Jack Sparrow or Thor, um, or if it was you know from like kind of, uh, especially when I went to college and started studying theology and everything I was reading was all predominantly written by white males. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't know, maybe it was all of it. But the point is that that message sunk in with me at a very young age. And, uh, and it took the Holy Spirit through scripture to show me that actually, no, that's not my plan. God never intended for me or anybody to feel like they have to choose between who they are culturally or who they are in Christ, but that both of those, that God, had, God created us differently with different cultures on purpose. Uh, so that through diversity, just like through male and female, we fully reflect the image of God and the different cultures, different races, that these are things that are going to uh, follow us into heaven, right? Sometimes we tend to think about uh, racial or ethnic or linguistic or cultural diversity like they're a like they're an earthly kind of struggle that we'll get over one day. And that's why we, I think that's behind sometimes when we say things like, why can't we just get past this? Or like, I don't see color or I don't see difference, right? But again, don't call unclean what God has called clean, right? God didn't create us differently for us to ignore it or say, you know, it's like me saying, I don't see you as a woman. I just see you as a person. It's like, well, thank you, <laughs> but I am a woman and you're a man. And that's, you know, that's part of how God made us. And it's part of how he intended for us to be. And, and again, when John saw the heavenly vision in Revelation 7, 9, he saw people enfleshed. He saw them uh, in different skin tones, and he saw them in different hues, and he heard different languages, and he saw different cultural traditions. He said, I saw a heavenly multitude of every race, tribe, and tongue. So difference is not just for now. It's forever. It's for eternity. Um, and even at, you know, and that's, that's a connection to Acts 2, right, when the Holy Spirit falls at Pentecost, and every nation, tribe, tongue are hearing the gospel in their own language. So actually, when we come into Christ, it's not an invitation to reject our culture or to deny it or to, uh, you know, like not talk about it or try to not see it. Uh, but it's actually to celebrate it even more. That's why I love the vision of reading Theology African. Athanasius and, you know, Cyril and every theologian is, in a, is, is cultural, right? There's no such thing as, you know, theology that is a-cultural or that is not cultural because theology is a human work, right? It's in response to what God has done through revelation and through scripture and through the gospel, 
but all theology is done from human beings who are in certain cultural historical situations and that that colors uh, you know no pun intended how we talk about theology just like all food is cultural right but we have this tendency to you know say things like ethnic food right and then what do we mean when we say ethnic food you know we mean like non-white food right like non-american food um, and so, but all food is ethnic, right? You know, tater tot casserole is ethnic. That's cultural. Croissants are cultural. Um, and, you know, caramel macchiatos is cultural. And so everything is cultural, right? But we have the same practice in theology that will, you know, sometimes put labels in front of theology, like African theology, you know, Hispanic theology, you know, Asian theology, Dalit theology. But then when it's theology from John Calvin or Martin Luther or Karl Barth or Schleiermark, it's just theology, right? There's no, there's no modifier. But everybody is doing theology from a location. The, 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 the imagery I love from missiologist Andrew Walls is like the church is like a theater uh, watching a stage play. We're all watching the same play, but we're seeing it from different perspectives, right? So don't, don't, don't hear me wrong. There's not multiple plays. <laughs> There's not multiple ways. Jesus is the only way, truth and the life. Uh, and the gospel is the only way to salvation. Uh, but we as the church, inside of the, the theater of the church, so to speak, we all have different seats and we have different uh, perspectives. People in the front row see things differently than the people in the balconies do. And people on stage left can see things that people on stage right can't even see. That's why we need to talk to each other. That's why we need to share. Our, our, our perspectives become more rich when we do that. Um, but that was really, uh, you know, so that's, that's really kind of my burden. Uh, my, I think, you know, so going back to when I was seven years old, my biggest burden really is to share the gospel is for people to come to know Christ uh, as Lord and Savior and to be reconciled to him. That's my biggest goal. Um, that's my biggest life's calling. And I'm convinced that the biggest single obstacle in the world that we live in today, uh, just by numbers maybe, not necessarily it's more important or anything, but just in terms of just sheer numbers, uh, I, I believe the biggest obstacle to people in the world today coming to faith in Jesus Christ is the perception that Christianity is only for white Western American people. And, and I say that, and it's hard for people to wrap their head around that in the United States, because when you share the gospel with people who aren't Christians uh, in, in, in like North America or Europe, it's usually for like philosophical or scientific or, or, you know, political or personal reasons, right? But that's only a small portion of the world. But when you go into South Asia and East Asia and Southeast Asia and the Middle East and Africa and native peoples of the Americas and, and you know, the Pacific Islands, the... I would argue the number one reason why people in those places don't want to be a Christian is because they see Christianity as a white Western American religion that is fundamentally antithetical to their identity. So it's a non-starter. You know, we forget about Jesus and who he says he is and salvation from sin. That's not the contention. Uh, it's not the contention that I don't believe in the miraculous. Most people believe in the miraculous. Most people believe in the divine. It's not for reasons of theology or, 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 or you know, kind of, again, the belief in the divine, but it's a, for reasons of identity. And that's a big issue around the world, but especially in my particular community, uh, in the urban African-American community, there are many people who are walking away from the church primarily for identity reasons, right? You guys have heard of like Kendrick Lamar, the rapper, right? You know, he says he's a Hebrew Israelite. Anybody familiar with the Hebrew Israelites? Um, this is one group of many. These are Af this is African-American religion that is uh, actually been around for a long time, but it claims that black people are the true Jews and that Christianity as it's taught is a white man's religion and you need to not trust the church. And there are so many groups like that, the conscious community or committed community, the Nation of Islam, the Moorish Science Temple, the 5% Nation of God on Earth. There are so many different groups, just in the African-American community, that all are rejecting the gospel and it's interesting because they're all rejecting it and going to different false teachings, but they're rejecting it for the same reason, right? And that's the other thing too, is that they're, they're walking away from the church. So they all have a Christian background. They all have a Christian beginning and they're walking away from the church uh, because of the way it's presented in the same way as it was for me. I remember being a young person trying to share the gospel to friends of mine and say, hey, you wanna come to church? You know, friends of mine, they'd be smoking weed, they'd be gang banging. You know, I, I grew up in a crip neighborhood and, you know, friends of mine that would be doing that stuff. And I'd be trying to get them to come to my, my white church with me that I was trying to assimilate to. And they were like, no, nah, bro, I'm good. You know, I'm good. And I was like, why not? You know, it's like, because they're singing that, you know, like acoustic guitar with all the songs about mountains and deers and valleys and rivers and lakes. And, and then they want to take you to those places. They want to go camping out in the woods and stuff and go sing to God out in the woods. I ain't, I'm good, bro. And so like, and so I, I, I would always just kind of like, you know, be frustrated, but then it, it clicked one day when I had that, that you know, that realization that uh, I was trying to present to them a, gospel, uh, a particular, you know, uh, method 
of discipleship and, and, and method of evangelism that wasn't suitable for them, right? Um, and so that's really my biggest burden uh, in life is really to, so, you know, I hope you hear me uh, when I say that, um, when I say that I think that it's time, kind of like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, to give greater honor to the parts that lack it, uh, that I am not saying that, you know, white people are bad or white expressions of Christianity are bad or white theology is bad or white worship is bad. In fact, I like, I like all of it, right? Uh, I, you know, I listen to Michael W. Smith and, and, and I love reading Karl Barth and I love, you know, uh, you know, so many different variations of European expression, right? Um, and so that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, again, that there's one particular sliver of the body of Christ that has a disproportionately large voice in how we do church. And there are myriad of other components of the body of Christ that do not have as much of a voice. And so that's where I'm, my, my sense of call is to do, again, what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, and that's give greater honor to the parts that have lacked it. And to illustrate it with a particular uh, biblical passage, one of my favorite passages is um, from uh, Acts 21, uh, where uh, Paul, the great missionary to the Gentiles, right, uh, who takes great pains to communicate the gospel to the Gentiles in Gentile ways, right? He, just a few chapters ago, he's in the Areopagus and he's preaching the gospel and he's even using and connecting it with pagan uh, Gentile worship in order so that he might bring them unto the God that is known, right? Um, but this, is a, this passage is a different picture than we usually think of with Paul, where um, in uh, Acts 21, Paul goes back to Jerusalem. And in verse 17, it says, when we arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers and sisters received us warmly. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James, and all the elders were present. Paul greeted them and reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. When they heard this, they praised God. Then they said to Paul, you see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed, and all of them are zealous for the law. They have been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs. What shall we do? They will certainly hear that you have come, so do what we tell you. There are four men with us who have made a vow. Take these men, join in their purification rites, and pay their expenses so that they can have their heads shaved. Then everyone will know that there is no truth in these reports about you, but that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. As for the Gentile believers, we have written to them our decision that they should abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. The next day, Paul took the men and purified himself along with them. Then he went to the temple to give notice of the date when the days of purification would end and the offering would be made for each of them. So one of the reasons I love this passage so much is that it shows uh, how, cons this is why I'm so concerned about this, right? This is, again, for, uh, for a lot of us, if you, again, if you've never been faced with the message directly or indirectly that, you know, it's either... It's either your Christian identity or your cultural identity, and the two don't go together. It can be hard to understand how much of a crisis this is, right? Uh, but when we look at Scripture, actually, uh, and it's usually the other way around, that, that for, you know, all throughout the New Testament, that Jesus and Paul and the New Testament writers are making it painfully out, and in the Old Testament as well, that God's salvation is not only for the Jews, right? And so Christianity is nobody's religion. It's nobody's religion, and it's everybody's religion, right? Uh, it doesn't belong to any one people, and yet God brings to himself a multitude of all peoples, and our cultures, again, are all reflected. So it doesn't belong to any one group. And Christianity is unique in that way, because most other, especially in the ancient world, most religions are tied to a particular language or culture or region or tribe or, or, or you know, a people group, that the gods or the god of a particular people group are intimately tied to that people. Uh, and so that conversion into that religion is like a conversion into that people group, into that culture. So there is a cultural assimilation as well as a theological. Christianity is unique in that way, in the fact that God, God creates unto himself a multitude of old people. And in his providence, he chose a people, Israel, who were strategically placed in every nation on earth. They were in Persia, in Arabia, in, in Rome, in Cappadocia, in North Africa, in Egypt. And that was the, the initial path that Christianity spread along in the first and early second century. Right. Um, and so but in this passage, I love seeing the way in which uh, now there are certain Jewish Christians that because of this emphasis that Paul's been placing on uh, that Gentiles can be Christians and, you know, you don't need to be circumcised, that that there was a miscommunication. There was a false perception being communicated among certain Jewish believers in Jerusalem that that Paul was saying that they should just forget about their Jewish heritage. 
But James shows us in this passage uh, that that was not God's intention, that Jews can still be Jews and that God is still allowing them and welcoming them to still be Jewish. And, the, and, and Paul goes in and him and these other, you know, Nazarites probably, they, he even pays for their purification. So he puts financial resources into it so that people who have been told that they have to reject their cultural identity to be a Christian that they can actually be empowered again. Just like having conversations like this is putting resources into trying to correct this false narrative. Just like it was a false report that the believers had received that Paul was saying you had to give up your Jewishness. And Paul never said that, right? But that's what people thought. And in the same way, Jesus never said, the Bible never says you have to give up your identity, but that's still a perception that we all have come across or many of us have come across. It's still a real perception regardless of the fact that it's not true. And so really trying to realign that perception is really kind of my goal. But again, not to disparage any other group, because all of us are brothers and sisters in Christ. That's our first and foremost identity, is as sons and daughters of the King, Jesus. And God has also made us in different cultures, right? And this is a huge stumbling block. So for that reason, uh, not to the denigration of someone else, that's where I'm arguing that we have to start placing attention on other, both past and present, other segments of the body of Christ that have not gotten enough attention so that people can see uh, who are still caught in the same struggle that I was caught in, that you can be Jesus, you can be, you can be who you are and follow Jesus. In fact, the only way to truly be who you are is to follow Jesus because Jesus is the completion of all of who we are, whether we're Chinese, Korean, black, Mexican, uh, you know, French, Irish, whatever. God, only in Christ can we be fully Irish and fully Jewish and fully uh, African-American and fully Korean. And that's God's plan for all of us, right? And so with, uh, that's, that's, um, that's, the, that's the theological and just personal dynamic I'm coming with. So with that, I'm going to transition into this, uh, into this lecture and talk a little bit about um, how we see that playing, kind of a little bit of where that first went wrong, but then also a, 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 an example. I'm going to show you an example, basically, of what I'm saying right now, how we can place attention on members of the body of Christ who have not gotten as much attention, but whose story actually are, are going to be very helpful, I believe, in helping us to share with various people who have this, this false perception. Um, and then uh, I'll just go through this and then we'll, we'll have some uh, questions and comments. So when we talk about Egyptian Christological identity, um, what, basically what the, the idea here is that, um, just to sum it up, that the Church of Egypt has a particular identity that is cultural and is theological at the same time. And one of the great things about this particular community is that, that the, again, the idea that Christianity is a, a white Western American religion, whatever, is totally foreign because as, as, as we know uh, here because of the work that Dr. Sanders and others have been doing, that actually some of the, some of the most foundational theologians were from Egypt and were from North Africa and were from the continent of Africa, right? Um, but the problem is that a little bit after a lot of those foundational uh, theologians in the you know, second, third, and fourth centuries, the fifth century witnessed a major rupture in the church. So, you know, what happened, right? This is a quick answer to like, how did we get here? How did we get to this uh, point that Christianity is seen as a white religion, right? When we know, as we said, in the New Testament itself, it shows us you had Ethiopian and you had uh, Persian and you had uh, Elamite and, and Roman and you had Christians of all cultures and there was, and, and, and there was no sense that it belonged to one people. And yet, 2,000 years later, all of us are saying, but we see this perception alive and well, that it's only for a certain people, right? Um, how did that get there? Well, I would argue that uh, it starts at the Council of Chalcedon in the year 451, and this is what's considered the Fourth Ecumenical Council as it's reckoned in the Roman Western tradition. Um, and this was a, a council that was the result of various Christological debates that were going on uh, in, the fourth, in the fifth century. In the fourth century, uh, a lot of the big topic, especially in the Roman Empire, um, was on Jesus's divinity, right? Now that wasn't, we always have to, you always have to specify when you're talking about church history, because one of my little pet peeves is when we, again, kind of like normativize and we say, well, th this was happening in the church when we're really talking about the Western or the Roman church, right? So we need to specify, we're talking about the Roman church right now, because the Persian church was not really wrestling with whether or not Jesus was God. They were pretty clear on that at, at the Council of Seleucia Tesiphon, which is in 315, before the Council of Nicaea, right? So there's multiple church histories that we always need to keep in mind. But in the Roman context, uh, because of Arianism, there was this belief, there was this struggle uh, that, you know, talking, uh, developing Trinitarian theology that, you know, all of these different communities that became split in the fifth century agreed about, about Jesus being, you know, fully God, 
and fully man, and that uh, the fa- God being the, the Godhead being Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the question that arose in the Roman Empire, uh, both East and West, in the fifth century was, if Jesus is God, then how is he also a human? And how do we talk about that in a way that makes sense? Well, um, at the Council of Chalcedon, uh, the, the decision was that, uh, and this was mainly through uh, the Roman Bishop Leo's tome, that G- the, way to, the way to best talk about or articulate the humanity and divinity of Christ is that Jesus is one hypostasis, and he exists in two physis, right? Um, so I'll just write that right here. I should have had it on the slide. Um, now, um, the, ch- the Persian church, uh, which had existed since you know, the beginning of Christianity in the Persian Empire, outside of the Roman Empire, had a totally different um, you know, Christology, where they would argue that Jesus is one parsopa, but that he has two kiane, and each of which have their own corresponding kenome. And a kenome in East Syriac thought is, is the kind of manifestation of a particular kiane or nature. Uh, but these terms do not equivocate to these terms. In fact, there really is no way to say kenome in Greek. And so a lot of this was kind of people talking past each other or not exactly having the same words in one another's language and, and, or these things meaning the same thing, right? Um, now, the Egyptian church, which is the focus of what we're talking about, they had a different theology where they said that Jesus is one hypostasis, but in one physis, so mia physis, that he is one physis. And this is something that Cyril of Alexandria said, although not exactly in the same way that it came to mean by the bishop of Egypt, Dioscorus. But uh, Dioscorus, who was the pope of Egypt, was sent into exile, and um, uh, there was a lot of tension then. That was, that's what, really what instigated the schism between uh, not only the Egyptian church, but then eventually the Arabian and Syrian and Armenian churches as well, split from the Roman church at the, uh, at the Council of 451. Um, uh, and so, uh, you know, the Byzantine emperor Zeno tried to issue a, uh, a document called the Henoticon, but uh, to kind of, you know, uh, say that, well, you, you know, we can accept the, the Tome of Leo, but not necessarily, or the Council of Chalcedon, but not the Tome of Leo. But it didn't ultimately work. And then um, in, you know, the, uh, in the 6th century, you have uh, Emperor Justinian, who was exiling the Patriarch of Antioch, Severus, as well as the Egyptian Patriarch, Theodosius. And the really his, uh, Justinian's uh, goal was to really try to bring the Roman Empire back uh, into unity, both theologically and imperially. But um, in the, uh, right, a little after the time Justinian died, Muhammad was born, and Islam is starting to get going in the middle of the Roman and Persian empires, which are warring with each other. And uh, actually, Emperor Heraclius uh, won back lots of the uh, Roman Empire from Persia, and also, just like Justinian before him, began to strongly enforce uh, Chalcedonian theology, right? The theology that Jesus is one person in two natures. Now, now the thing is, is that when you read the theology of the Tome of Leo, uh, and when you read the theology of Timothy Elyris, for example, or Dioscorus, both sides of this debate believe that Jesus is, that he's God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that Jesus, the Son of God, is fully God and fully human. The dispute came from talking about this word about natures, right? And so um, just to show, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip a little bit ahead uh, just to save some time. But this is, a, this is an excerpt from the Tome of Leo. And uh, this, is the, uh, this is the part here that becomes problematic. Everything else in the Tome of Leo would have been acceptable except for these words right here. The one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, recognized in two natures, without confusion, change, division, separation, uh, that it's, it's the, again, the idea of two natures did not work precisely because um, uh, the, the church of Persia, which uh, embraced some, uh, partly the uh, teachings of Nestorius also taught two natures. But again, in this particularly Persian way, uh, that, that was really not common or known to the churches of Egypt or Rome. And so, um, and so uh, what happened was the Egyptian church felt that the Chalcedonian decision that Jesus is one person and two physis, that there are two different physis in the Godhead, uh, the perception was, it's not an accurate one, but the perception on the part of the Egyptian church and then later the Syrian church was that, that the Council of Chalcedon was dividing the Trinity into a quaternity. Uh, they were making three into four and that they were dividing Jesus. Now that's not what the Tome of Leo or what subsequent centuries of Western Christianity that have adopted the Chalcedonian definition have m- intended to do, um, but that was the perception of it. In like manner, 
subsequent uh, centuries of Western Christian history have mischaracterized a lot of early Christianity in Egypt and Syria as being uh, one nature in a docetic way. That, they, that uh, even today in mo modern Western church history textbooks, a lot of Egyptian and Syrian and Arabian and Armenian Christianity is, is characterized as, uh, as believing in one nature and that that one nature is only actually divine and that the early uh, Egyptian or the even current Egyptian or Syrian Christians don't believe Jesus is fully human. And that's just not, that's just not the case. Um, so this is a quote from Timothy Elaris, who is the Pope of Egypt. And uh, again, you can kind of see the way in which uh, both of these sides are actually appealing to Athanasius and Cyril. They're both appealing to the same sources, uh, but they're interpreting them in different ways. They're basically both kind of uh, interpolating what they would have said if they had been alive today and, and would, are, were claiming that they would agree with them. Uh, Timothy Ehlers says that any of our sainted fathers who said that the, one, that the one Christ was of two natures taught that God's word became incarnate from our common human nature. For, and this is the key right here. Uh, he's, trying to, he's trying to comment on what Leo is picking up on in earlier church theologians who, who did talk about two natures. Uh, and this is the key, though. He says, for before the incarnation, God's word was fleshless. But after the incarnation, he is one nature, one physis, me a physis. Not monophysite. Right? That's a considered a you know Nestorian and monophysite are not good terms to use. And uh, you know Church of the East for the Persian Church, uh, not Nestorian, and then Miaphysite for the Coptic and Syrian Orthodox and Armenian, uh, which means one nature um, and not monophysite. But he's saying, but after the incarnation, he is one nature, Miaphysis, of God the Word incarnate, of human flesh and common soul. Um, and so, again, we can see right here that Timothy Ehlers is claiming that Jesus is fully God, he's fully man, he's not one more than the other, um, but that his humanity and his divinity exist in one physis. So the difference lies in how people are understanding the word physis, and, and then also how that word is being translated into other language. This comes a bit later, but the Ethiopian church that weighs in on this, uh, in, their, in, in the Ethiopian language, there, there isn't multiple words to talk about person and nature. It's just one word. So in, when you translate the Tome of Leo into that language, what they're hearing is that Jesus is two people, that there are two different Jesuses, right? Again, that's not what's intended to be communicated, but that would be how it would be received in that language. So this is where I'm arguing that the debate here in the fifth century, and actually popes and patriarchs of these churches today have even said this, not just me, that really this was a linguistic and cultural misunderstanding and doesn't actually, to quote literally, doesn't touch the essence of our shared faith. Um, but unfortunately, this has been a rift that still persists into the present of 1,500 years. Um, and and um, uh, not only that, but also it entailed a, uh, a relationship of oppression. So at, at 451, uh, when kind of orthodoxy began to be framed specifically by the Roman councils, and that particular articulation of Christianity was seen as the only right one, then uh, what happened was 200 years of oppression of the Roman church coming in and persecuting the Egyptian and Syrian and Arabian churches, which kind of engendered this bitter uh, divide within the church that was largely geographical and culture. It was almost like, for, you know, in many respects, it was almost kind of like the European church uh, coming in and persecuting the African and the Middle Eastern church. Meanwhile, the Asian church is growing and going into China and India and just doing its own thing and not even, in, in some ways, not even affected by a lot of this tension that's going on in the Roman Empire. Um, and this is an example of this uh, from the life of Daniel of Scatus. Daniel of Scatus was an Egyptian bishop uh, in the Wadi Natrun. And, um, and this is a, an example of that Emperor Justinian that I mentioned, who was going all throughout the Roman Empire and enforcing the Chalcedonian Creed, in, and, and even to the point of kidnapping monastic leaders and popes and, uh, and replacing them with Chalcedonian Roman uh, theologians. So again, this is, this is that tension that, that I'm talking about that really just kind of widened the gap. So it says, and it was at this time, at that time, that the impious Justinian became emperor, he who has polluted and terrorized the entire world and the Catholic Church in every place. So notice how from the Egyptian side, they are the Catholic Church, and you know, the, uh, what would actually be known as the Catholic Church is the impious, uh, you know, uh, terrorizing, polluted church. And that's not a nice way to talk. I'm not con condoning that. Um, it's not good, Daniel. But, um, but he says, he endeavored to enforce the accursed faith of the defiled Council of Chalcedon everywhere and scattered the beautiful flocks of Christ. He chased the Orthodox bishops and archbishops from their thrones, and the impious Justinian was not satisfied with this, but also disseminated the impious Tome of Leo, which the impious Council of Chalcedon had accepted. He propagated it everywhere that lay under his control in order to make everyone subscribe to it. So notice from the Egyptian uh, side point, the marriage of 
Roman imperial authority uh, and, and the empire and the particular expression of Chalcedonian faith, right? So this is where you're starting to see in the Western, the, the seeds in the Western world of church and state uh, and kind of Christian nationalism becoming uh, kind of a thing. And that goes back to Constantine. Um, but, and, and also we see the kind of the complications that that makes for brothers and sisters in Christ who live outside of that cultural sphere of influence. Um, and this continues, it, uh, when it was brought to Egypt, the tome, a great disturbance occurred among all the Orthodox faithful who were in the land of Egypt. And it was brought to the holy mountain of Scatus in order that our holy fathers might subscribe to it. Since our holy father Daniel was father of Scatus at that time, the Lord revealed the matter to him before it was brought to Scatus. The saint himself gathered together all the elders and told them what the Lord revealed to him. And he taught them everything in order that they became strong in the Orthodox faith and not turn away even unto death. When the emperor's soldiers brought the tome, filled with every impiety of lawless Leo, to the holy mountain of Scatus, our holy father Abba Daniel came out before them. In like manner, the superior came out to meet them, along with multitudes of elders among the saints. When the elders met the soldiers, the soldiers brought the tome filled with impiety and extended it to the elders, saying, The emperor has commanded all of you to subscribe to the formula of the faith. Our holy father Abba Daniel, the blessed superior, responded and said to the soldiers, What formula of the faith is this? They said to him, that of the great council of Chalcedon, of which 634 bishops gathered. Our father Abba Daniel was filled with the grace of the Holy Spirit. He leapt forward and seized that tome filled with every impiety. He tore it and cried out to the soldiers saying, anathema to the defiled council of Chalcedon, anathema to anyone who is in communion with it, anathema to anyone who believes according to it, anathema to anyone who turns away from the life-giving suffering of Christ. As for us, it will never happen that we accept this impious rule of the faith, but we will anathematize everyone who accepts it and believes in it. We will believe in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, consubstantial trinity existing in a single Godhead unto our last breath. And so you kind of see the, the uh, continuation, actually, of Egyptian theological resistance of martyrdom. I mean, there's a, this is like a martyr story, right, from like the first or second century, only instead of it being Christians facing the lions in the Colosseum by pagans, it's Christians being martyred by Christians. Now, I'm not, you know, the Egyptians actually committed acts of violence as well, so I'm not just saying, oh, they're the good guys and the Romans are the bad guys. But what I am saying is that this was the beginnings of a, uh, a, the way that theology had become encapsulated uh, in kind of the Greco-Roman context and language and philosophical um, you know, conceptualizations to the point to where that became the only seat in the theater by which that was seen as authoritative, right? And other seats in the same theater of the body of Christ were seen as not uh, authoritative or not as, not as valid. Um, and then uh, this, is a, this is just to, you know, show this is a, some wall graffiti from the Monastery of the Syrians. Uh, it just, uh, this is a monastery also in the Wadi Natrun in Egypt that uh, shows kind of the, the unity that was happening between uh, various Syrian and Arabian and Egyptian bishops who were also uh, the same kind of thing that happened in Egypt was happening in Arabia and in Syria and Armenia as well. And there was a unity that grew. And even today, this branch of Christianity is all are largely united in one, you know, called Oriental Orthodox. Um, and yet uh, th there was a way in which uh, the Egyptian church uh, understood its it's kind of me aphazite identity to be international and as to be one universal Catholic church. And yet at the same time, there's evidences uh, in sixth century Christian, uh, Egyptian Christological identity of there being kind of a pro Egyptian rhetoric that happens. Um, and Severus of Antioch was the Bishop of Antioch. And he was also kicked out uh, of his, by Emperor Justin, Justinian's uncle. And he was sent into exile in Egypt where he lived and uh, likely at the monastery of the Syrians and was joining with the Egyptian church. Um, but, and I won't, I won't, you know, I won't read it for, uh, for time's sake, but this, uh, this quote basically shows that there was uh, unity for the most part uh, between Cal uh, anti-Chalcedonians or Miaphysites in different cultural contexts. Uh, but that according to Severus, there was still kind of an ethnocentrism among Egyptian Christians to where they still kind of felt like they were better than other people. And, uh, he says, I'll just read this part right here where he says, it's the habit of the Alexandrians to think that the sun rises for them only and towards them only the lamp shines so that they even jokingly nickname outside cities as lampless. Um, and so uh, there, was, there, was, there was an issue going on as Syrian and Arabian and Egyptian Miaphysites were all living in exile and living under uh, the oppression of the Roman Chalcedonian church and empire where um, they were joining together. 
But Severus indicates in his letter that, that some of them didn't want to take communion with each other and that it was really just for cultural differences. And Severus is actually pushing against this and saying, hey, we're all Miaphysites, we're all Christians, we're all Orthodox, we're, we're all on the same side. It's those Chalcedonian, impious Roman folks uh, that are the bad guy. And, um, but it still kind of shows that, you know, kind of a differentiation, but also to the, to the degree to which the more the Egyptian church in particular was suffering under Chalcedonian hegemony, that it actually even engendered a greater response or a greater degree of ethnic pride and resistance that was not really there before. When you read the Desert Fathers or when you read Athanasius or Anthony or even Shenouda, who's the first kind of big Coptic writer in the Coptic language, there, there's certainly a pride in being Egyptian, but it's not a big deal. It doesn't really come to the fore in a major way. But after the Council of Chalcedon, where there's this big schism, now you start to see this, this ethnic rhetoric, if you will, or this pro-Egyptian emphasis and how that's linked specifically with Miaphysite doctrine uh, come to the fore in a major way. Um, and so um, going into the seventh century, uh, Benjamin of Alexandria is another kind of good witness to this dynamic, the same dynamic now that's been happening for two years, since the year 451. Uh, up until now, Benjamin was the Pope of Egypt starting in the 620s, and uh, some of us are actually reading some of his writings today. And Benjamin lived at a very crucial time in Egyptian history. He lived, he was the Pope of Egypt uh, for, you know, almost 40 years before, during, and after both the Persian conquest of Egypt, the Roman reconquest of Egypt, and the eventual Islamic uh, conquest of Egypt. He lived and saw all of that. And yet, interestingly, um, this is, a, this is a, um, uh, an excerpt from Benjamin uh, as he, after the, after the Muslims conquered Egypt, interestingly, the Miaphysite Christians actually uh, came back into power. Um, and, and it's highly likely that the Muslim conquerors knew that there was a tension between the Egyptian Miaphysites and the Roman Chalcedonian imperial authorities, and that's probably why Miaphysites were given more favor in Islamic-controlled Egypt. And so Benjamin was allowed to kind of almost run the country, because even though Muslims were in charge now, they were in the numerical minority. Most Egyptians were still Christians. And it was specifically, again, the Miaphysite church, because they knew there was already a bitter relationship between the Roman Empire that they had just conquered. Oh, thank you. Um, and so, uh, so, so what's interesting about the writings of Benjamin is that he's, he writes this and, uh, you know, the, 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 the Islamic governor, Amr ibn al-As, has allowed Benjamin to go back into, uh, he, he had been living in exile because Emperor Heraclius was, kicked him out of, out of his office and replaced him with a uh, Chalcedonian patriarch that the Egyptian church rejected. Um, and it's interesting, the sources often refer to this, his name is Cyrus, and they refer to him as Cyrus the Caucasian but not in the sense that we use it today, but as in the sense that he was from the Caucasus Mountains, right? But even the fact that they identify him as a foreigner shows the degree to which Miaphysite theology was ingrained in the Egyptian Christological consciousness as part of their cultural identity. And so Benjamin was living in exile in the Egyptian desert for 13 years, but when the Muslims conquered, he was allowed back to be the patriarch again, and he went back into churches and monasteries, and he was reestablishing them and reestablishing the Miaphysite church, and this is an excerpt from when he consecrated a, uh, the, the church of Macarius at the monastery of Macarius in uh, the Wadi Natrun. And he's giving thanks to God for his freedom, which is, which is really interesting uh, that, that Benjamin is actually displaying signs of gratefulness for the Muslim conquest of Egypt. Um, and now, that, now that's a tricky, touchy subject. And Christians in Egypt and all over the, what then became the Islamic world had varying degrees of responses to Islamic conquest. But uh, Benjamin, for one, particularly, had, it seems to express uh, positivity and really has no critique of, of Islamic conquerors, but really only of, of actually still Roman Chalcedonians who aren't even in power anymore, but he's just still so mad at them. Um, so he says, I give you thanks, my Lord Jesus Christ because you have made me worthy once more to witness the freedom of expression of the Orthodox faith and the fulfillment of the holy churches, the destruction and overthrow of the godless heretics. He's talking about, you know, Chalcedonians now. He's not talking about Muslims because they're the ones that just won. Um, the praise is yours, benevolent Savior, for the way in which you have allowed me to see the churches yet again in their glory and their good condition. I give you thanks, my Lord Jesus Christ, for you have saved my soul from the hands of the tyrant, dragon apostate, the one who chased me on account of the Orthodox faith. He's talking about Cyrus, the Chalcedonian imposed, replaced patriarch that, that, that um, Heraclius put in his place. I give you thanks, my Lord Christ, for you have allowed me to see my sons once more 
as they surround me in your honor, my Lord Jesus. And, uh, and this, is a, this is another really great example that shows, again, the, the consolidation of Egyptian identity with Miaphysite theology, with Egyptian Christological identity. Uh, this, is a, this is another monastery, the monastery of Metris, that Benjamin came back after he returned back as the pope, and he was going back and kind of re-strengthening all the different churches and monasteries. He went to one in particular, and he has some interesting comments about it. He says, now the place wherein the patriarch dwelt was a pure habitation without defilement. And what does defilement mean? In a monastery called the Monastery of Metris, which was the Episcopal residence, for all the churches and monasteries which belonged to the virgins and monks had been defiled by Heraclius the heretic, right? So again, Chalcedonianism is kind of cast as defilement. Um, when he forced them to accept the faith of Chalcedon, accept this monastery alone, for the inmates of it were exceedingly powerful, being Egyptians by race, and all of them natives, without a stranger among them or foreigner among them. And therefore he could not incline their hearts towards him. For this reason, when the father Benjamin returned from Upper Egypt, he took up his residence with them because they had kept the Orthodox faith and had never deviated from it. So again, notice uh, the reason that Benjamin gives that this particular monastery had not apostatized, or you know, I'm not calling Chalcedonian theology heretical, uh, but I'm just also not calling Miaphysite Christology heretical, but he did, I don't agree with him. Um, but he's saying, uh, you know, he's saying what was the factor that helped these Egyptian uh, monks in this monastery not apostatize or become defiled in their faith through Chalcedonianism. It was the fact that they're Egyptians by race with no foreigners among them. And he says, for this reason, when the father returned, he took up his residence. So it's showing very clearly the degree to which Miaphysite Christology, which in their minds is the only orthodoxy, had come to overlap with being Egyptian. So for this particular context, the idea that Christianity is a Roman or Western religion, a lot of these different groups that I was talking about earlier, a big claim you'll often hear is that, you know, Christianity was invented by the Roman Empire uh, during the time of Constantine as a method to subjugate black people and, and people of color. And, and nobody believed Jesus was God before uh, the fourth century. So these people obviously are not reading Irenaeus and, and you know, uh, Justin Martyr and, and all these other folks, Tertullian. But that's the idea, right? And the, and, and, but that kind of idea is totally foreign to this context. Uh, because this particular expression of Christianity happened at the same time as Roman and Platonic and Hellenistic Christianity, and it happened centuries before there was a Roman dominance in Christianity, before there was any kind of dominance in Christianity. And not only that, but there was actually a tension between uh, Cal Coptic and Egyptian and Roman Chalcedonian Christianity. Uh, but yet, this particular community fought for their particular expressions of orthodoxy. Right? Now, I'm not saying fighting is good, but I'm saying that one thing that is good is the idea that these Egyptian uh, believers were so sure of their own cultural identity and, and proud of their Egyptian heritage that they weren't about to assimilate to any other person's particular expression of Christology, but they were fighting for their own. And that's the piece of it that I think we need to really reclaim, and, and especially by going back and looking at Christian traditions that are in Africa and Middle East and Asia that even precede Western European colonialism. Um, and this is, I'll end with this one and then uh, stop for some questions and comments and discussion. But this is a, this is a, a picture of a, of a monastery that, wa that, that was the one I mentioned a minute ago that Benjamin came in and reconsecrated in the seventh century. The this is at the monastery of Macarius in the Wadi Natrun. And this is kind of a unique cross. I don't know if anybody's ever seen one like it before, but I hadn't seen one like it before. Uh, it's a cross shaped into the roof. And sorry, it's a little blurry, but if you can kind of make out, uh, each end of the cross has two um, kind of... Uh, ends to each end of it, right, which is a little bit, it's kind of like the Coptic cross. I actually had a picture of more of a modern Coptic cross that a lot of them look like. Nowadays, a lot of them have that three-sided end to represent the Trinity. Um, but this one was unique, and I was asking the monks, well, you know, why was it made that way? It's kind of unique, and they were saying that's actually meant to represent Egyptian Christological identity, which is why I want to end with this, that this represents the humanity and divinity of Christ coming into one nature after the incarnation, right? Um, but that and this, this is a visual, I think a good visual depiction of the way in which the Egyptian church found its own unique way to identify and represent the distinctiveness of Jesus' humanity and his divinity, and yet the fundamental unity of them in the one person, Jesus Christ. So thank you very much. This gets tricky because there's a lot of, there's a big debate in 
ancient studies, classical studies, you know, late antiquity studies, early Christianity about if you can even talk about issues like race and ethnicity and identity in the ancient world. There's like, oh, that's a modern concept. Nobody in the ancient world thought about race or ethnicity or anything like that. Um, I, you know, and there's a lot of great books on that. The Ethnic Origins of Nations, Why This New Race by Denise Buell, uh, The Invention of Racism in Classical Antiquity by Benjamin Isaac. Uh, but, you know, I'm, so I'm saying that cognizant of the fact that I'm entering into a very lively debate uh, in classical and in late antique studies. But I'm on the side that says I do think that the ancient world saw, noticed that people looked different and that noticed that people had different cultures and ethnic identities. Yes, they didn't make of that what we make of it today. They didn't think of it in the same way that we do today. Um, but I mean, honestly, is there even a uniform way that we think of race or ethnicity or culture even today in the world we live in? So I don't think that there is or has ever been a uniform agreed upon identity about what race, ethnicity, culture even mean. And so, so to say they didn't think of it the same way we do isn't really saying much. Um, but um, all that to say that I think like today, uh, most, uh, most of us as, as a lot of times as Christians, I would argue that we have an underdeveloped um, kind of an underdeveloped theology of culture, right? That sometimes we don't, uh, we don't know or realize even our own cultural biases or influences and how they affect everything we do, right? Culture is the lens through which we see the world and it's the value system through which we make decisions. And it's what we, it's what it's, and it's a communally shared thing. It's what we decide, how we decide what's funny and what is respectful and how respect is communicated or honor or shame or, uh, you know, all of these different things, right? And so um, I think that in the same way uh, that the, the Chalcedonian and the Miaphysite, as I've shown you, they all thought they were right and the other one was wrong. One of them just had the power to actuate it and say, because you're wrong, we're going to come in and enforce it on you, right? And so I don't think that uh, colonialism or bigotry or hegemony is, uh, none, no people group is immune to that. I think if any of us had the power, we would all do it. <laughs> um, and it's just certain of us have been able to do it. Uh, and others of us have done it in other times, right? And so I think that um, I think that I think that in many of these cases, folks didn't realize the different cultural and linguistic factors that were going into their particular way of talking about the wording they're using to talk about the full humanity and full divinity of Christ, which they all believed in. Uh, but I don't think they were really cognizant of you know the cross-cultural dynamics that were going on, and rather just said that sounds different than the way I say it, so it must be wrong, right? Which I think that's kind of a human tendency to automatically judge something as wrong, uh, you know, just because it's not the same as you. Like David Livermore has a great book called Cultural Intelligence, um, and he uh, he has this. I mean, this is again getting in, out of the patristics, but I think he has this really helpful way of um, uh, of talking about what he calls category width. And so he'll he'll say that um, most cultures in the world divide behaviors and value systems into three categories, uh, good, bad, and different. Like all of us in here believe that there are things that are good and there are things that are bad and there are things that are just different. Killing people is bad and you know, helping someone who falls on the floor is good no matter what culture you're in. That's, that's a good thing for the most part. But you know, some cultures, when you come over someone's house, you take your shoes off before you enter the house. Other cultures you don't. That's not really good or bad. It's not a sin if you don't. It's not a sin if you do. It's just different. There's different strokes for different folks, as my dad would say. But Livermore talks about category width in the sense that every culture has these categories, but some of us have wider categories of different than others. And for some of us, our category of different is very narrow. We are, some of us are like, often will want to put as little things as possible in the different category, and we want as many things as possible to be in the only good or the only bad category. And don't, again, don't hear me wrong, the scripture is clear that there's a lot of things that are just good or bad, that are sinful and that are righteous. Um, but there are also a lot of things that are just different. And it's just, I mean, again, his book is called Cultural Intelligence, right? And one thing I will say is that uh, conversation about different cultures is really more developed in the modern world. Uh, but again, it's not to say that people didn't think about that back then because Bar Dyson of Edessa was a third century heretic who wrote a text called The Book of the Laws of the Countries. And it was an anthropological study of, you know, and, and you know, Aristotle and all these other people, they also wrote these, you know, kind of, kind of proto-anthropological studies trying to explain why different people do different things. So again, ancient world thought and culture, but I think we've advanced it. Uh, we, at least we have it at a higher level now. 
But even still, we don't always, I was sharing this example in the, in the, in the class earlier. This is, a, this is a generalization, right? But I don't know if anybody else has ever seen this uh, or experienced this. But again, I'm black and white, so I traverse a lot of black and white worlds. And one thing I've noticed is generalization, not true for everybody, but I've noticed that a lot of black churches tend to be a lot more lively in their worship and in the preaching and in the interaction, right? And a lot of white churches tend to be a little bit more reserved and quiet, right? I would argue that there's a cultural value system at play that's not for everybody, right? But nothing's for everybody, right? Um, there's, a, there's generalizations to everything. Um, and so uh, I would say there's a cultural value system at play uh, that in African and African-descended cultures in interaction and in call and response. And in, there's, I think there's a cultural value in, among many African people and African-descended people that uh, if you are to demonstrate that you're in agreement with and appreciating what's being said, you vocalize that and you show it verbally. Thank you. Come on, somebody. But, and I would say that in many European and European descended cultures and Asian cultures as well, it's the opposite. That you re communicate respect and you communicate attentiveness by listening and being quiet, right? And so those are two different value systems that actually are opposite, <laughs> you know? And so, but the problem comes when we judge one another, right? And the other thing I've seen, right, is a lot of judgment going both ways. I've seen a lot of black people judge white churches and say, they're, they're dead, they don't got the Holy Spirit, they're not saying nothing, they're just quiet, they're not, I must not have been preaching good, they, you know, and, and, and they, or they must not really be listening to the Holy Spirit. And, and it's a judgment, that, you can't say that, you don't, know, you don't know that, but it's a judgment based on your cultural values, and the same thing happens the other way. Why are they so loud in church? Why are they putting so much attention on the pastor and the choir? It's a big showmanship. It's all, it's all emotionalism and no, and no meat, blah, blah. It's, again, judging people's cultures when you don't even have the language to judge it. Exactly what happened at Cal Seton. So, Holy, uh, Bechor, how, mm -hmm. how did that look? I think, I mean, that gets into another big topic about, you know, uh, are all churches called to be multi-ethnic? Um, like the book, um, <laughs> what's the book? United by Faith, uh, like 10 years ago, the, like they argued. Uh, or is there a place for mono-ethnic uh, churches, especially that have a particular mission uh, to them to reach a particular people group. And so that's a, that's, a, that's a big issue. I think it depends on what, you know, what is the mission of the church that you've stepped into, what's their kind of goal. Um, but I do think that if a church is going to be multi-ethnic and not just say that it is, or, you know, just for marketing or whatever and say, yeah, we're multi-ethnic. We have like, you know, two Nigerian families and a Korean international student and, you know, 98% white people. I'm like, okay, come on, really? Um, but, uh, if you were, if we're, if we're actually believe that God has called us to be intentionally multi-ethnic, then I do think it has to be very intentional. And I, and I would say that uh, we have to be very careful not to assimilate to any particular culture and the way that they, you know, so, but we have to bring our own authentic voices. Because again, when I look at Revelation 7, 9, I, you know, John saw and we see and we hear of, of, of a heavenly multitude where everyone's authentic flavor is all there, right? So we like to use the salad bowl analogy, but God doesn't want a salad bowl where you just drench the whole thing in ranch sauce. And now every single thing that once had its own flavor all tastes like ranch sauce, right? And that's, that's kind of what we have going on where we, we have assimilation going. And again, it just depends on the calling, but I would say if that's the call of that church, then I would say that you don't want to do that. Yeah, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, you know, um, room here. All right. Oh, here we go. Thank you, Jesus. I need an eraser. Um, sorry if you didn't get this, but I think, again, going to, um, uh, well, I would say, I would say I, I'm not necessarily, uh, you know, don't really necessarily feel uh, like I can speak to what other people should or shouldn't be connecting to in ancient times. I will say, for my, I will speak for myself that as a scholar of Ethiopian and ancient Egyptian and Nubian Christianity, and like who I live and breathe in this stuff all day, every day, um, I haven't chosen to convert to this particular expression of Christianity. Uh, not that I have a problem. I see it as my brothers and sisters in Christ that are Trinitarian and believe in Jesus is the only way and the Bible is the word of God. So they're my brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, but, uh, but I also really appreciate the rich history of the African-American church uh, and, and that I really connect with a lot more culturally. And, and so uh, I, don't, I, I don't personally approach it in kind of a, um, uh, kind of like a um, neo-orthodox way of like going back to ancient stuff. Um, but when I look, for me, when I look at this history of a people who, though they were being subjugated, and they definitely did wrong too, but at the end of the day, they were actually the ones being killed and, uh, and persecuted. Um, and um, 
I, I find inspiration, especially on this side of the transatlantic slave trade and this side of the encomienda system and mission schools among Native Americans and Padrado systems in India and in the Caribbean, and the list goes on and on of you know, uh, manifest destiny, that the ways in which, uh, you know, uh, ways in which the, this, uh, again, not white Christianity and white expressions of Christianity is good and great, and that's been here since, since the Bible and going forward. But a white or any dominant church is what I'm saying is the problem, and that's what has created the, the problem. And so for me, uh, I don't see it as a means of going back to or trying to reclaim or connect with something from a long time ago, but I see it more as inspiration for those of us on, the, on this side of, of colonialism and slavery and, uh, and the implication of mission, Western missions with colonialism and the, the residue and the difficulty that that has made it for Christians in various parts of Asia, Africa, Polynesia, and uh, South America. It's a very hard thing for Christians, right? Because, because Christianity is still seen largely as a Western, white, American, whatever you want to call it, religion, it makes it hard for Christians who live in the non-West, right? We talk about, you know, Philip Jenkins, you know, great book, uh, Next Christendom, talking about how Christianity is a global religion, right? Now, one thing I like to point out is that, well, yes, that, that's true, but it's always been a global religion, right? It's not becoming a global religion. It's been a global religion since day one, since the book, since the New Testament, um, since the Old Testament. But, um, but we're seeing it go into new places, and, and maybe we're feeling the effects of that glo globalness more visibly. Uh, but it's always been a global religion. And... Um, um, but again, this side of colonialism and slavery, m much of the non-Western Christian world has, uh, has their roots in Western colonialism and or slavery. And so now we have to try to work to disentangle that and figure out, again, what is our seat in the theater, not, not towards ethnocentrism or not towards an idolatry of our cultural identity, but to truly own who we are in the way that God intended us to and not feel that we have to assimilate to another expression of Christianity um, just because it's better. Because that's still a problem. Even as Christianity is blowing up all over the world, it's very often a Western American uh, kind of white expression of Christianity that's being practiced in many different countries in the world. And we got to think about what does that look like to, uh, you know, what does that look like to non-Christians in that particular place? Like, the, you know, gospel is blowing up in China. And yes, and praise God for that, right? But it's, ve it's very, very often in the house churches and the international churches and the government churches, it's often a very westernized expression of Christianity. And so non-Christians who see that, they don't see, they don't see their fellow, oftentimes don't see their fellow Chinese uh, citizens who have converted to Christianity as they don't see it as, oh, you've made a theological conversion or you've followed Jesus. No, you've become American. You've become Western. You joined a Western religion. And that dynamic is all over the place. I just use that as one example. And so I think that's, that's for me what the value in looking at this stuff uh, that is pre-colonial, that even precedes kind of uh, Westernizing Christianity, right? I'm not talking, I'm not saying anything about Western Christianity. I'm talking about Westernizing Christianity is the problem. That this stuff shows us that, um, that there are Christians that are Asian, uh, Christians in China, I and mean, we didn't even get into that, but Christians in China since the 600s, Christians in India since the 200s, and, uh, and you know, Christians in the Arabian Peninsula since the 300s, and all of these expressions of Christianity were in this, these different parts of the world, and sometimes even fought against uh, attempts at westernizing. And so I don't, uh, I don't think we should be looking to this to spread disunity uh, or, or discord, but I do think we can look at the, the meat that we can glean and, and spit out the bones, spit out the bones of violence and, 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 uh, and, and you know, all these other kind of things. But I think we can take the meat of that God is calling us as a play, especially again, giving greater honor to the parts that lack it. I think that uh, Christians of color in particular really need to do, we need to do work to start to really um, contextualize our, our theology, our worship, the way we do church in a way that embraces a lot of our ancestry and our culture and our identity in ways that, I mean, just to give you an example, I have friends that are Native American with the North American Institute of Indigenous Theological Studies, and this is a network, a coalition of Native American biblical Christians who are contextualizing the gospel. And they're figuring out, they're deciding for themselves, like, and through, obviously through the leadership of the Holy Spirit, but not with another group deciding for them what they can and can't keep and take, right? And so they're having sweat lodges in Jesus' name as a way of worshiping Jesus, and they have Christian totem poles, right? But they get pushed back, not only from white Christians, but from other native Christians. 
who would tell them you can't do that because that's not that's not part of you know uh, that's 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 a pagan thing that has its roots in paganism, and then they'll come back and say, okay, well, what about Christmas trees, and what about Christmas wreaths, and what about the name Easter, right? Western Christianity is littered with pagan pre-Christian. Anglo-Saxon European imagery and language, and we've just fused it with Christianity to the point we forgot about that, right? And that's okay. That's okay. That's a, that's a, we, you know, when, when, when Christianity came into Germania and, and, you know, uh, the Saxons began to become Christians, uh, a lot of them under pain of death, but, but they began to contextualize the gospel and talk about Jesus as the, as the warrior and began to, and then they, instead of worshiping trees, they use that to, you know, celebrate Christmas trees. That's fine, but why can't Native American brothers do the same thing with totem poles? And why can't, you know, Christians around the world uh, do, do similar ways of content? We have, to, we have to avoid the extremes of, again, if the gospel invites us to embrace our culture and reject it at the same time, then we can't only do one of those, right? Uh, and I think the first step is we need to recognize our culture. We need to be able to acknowledge it. And that's hardest for the dominant culture. It's, I think, I think non-white people can acknowledge and recognize white culture better than white people can. <laughs> you know, because it's like trying to explain water to a fish, right? If you're, you know, uh, or another analogy that uh, was used once is that it's like trying to explain uh, to a right-handed person the way that the world is really made for, for right-handed people. Trying to explain, because you don't see it, but when you're left-handed, you see it and you're reminded of it every day. I'm not, I'm right-handed and I don't, ever think about the fact that I'm right-handed. Um, and you know, when you're in the dominant culture, you just don't think about it. And so I think that's the extra step that our white brothers and sisters in Christ uh, will often have is to first acknowledge uh, cultural difference and be able to discern the difference. Well, is this a biblical value or is this actually just my cultural value and know the difference? Because they're not always this, the same. Um, but then for all of us to embrace, and that includes our white brothers and sisters, all of us to be able to embrace who we are in Christ and to transform it at the same time. Uh, yeah, in the back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think that that was definitely a factor, um, uh, and I think we have to we have. I, I, I say this only because of issues in scholarship that we have to be careful how far we understand that to have played a role in the fifth century Christological controversies. There's a whole kind of field of scholarship that that really reduced a lot of these Christological controversies to just being kind of political or nationalistic, you know, there's basically, I mean, I'm just being uh, crass and summarizing, but a lot of early uh, late antique and, er, and patristic scholarship basically just kind of summarized Coptic and Syriac and Armenian Christology and this resistance that we're seeing. They just kind of characterize it and summarize it as, well, they were just nationalists. They didn't, they didn't really care about uh, orthodoxy or theology. They just cared about, you know, the Alexandrian church being on top and the Antiochian church being on top and the Roman church cared about them being on top and they came out the winner, uh, you know, in the Roman empire. Again, Seleucia Tesfan was a whole other, uh, you know, kind of bishop that we need to have another lecture on. Um, but, uh, and so, so certainly there was that vying for power because part of the canons of Chalcedon was also recognizing that's when that, this is when you finally start to see the idea that Rome and that the bishop, the, the, the seat of Peter is above other apostles. That wasn't really part of earlier Christianity. There was a sense in which Peter was kind of the rock and that he was, you know, had a certain primacy, but there wasn't a sense in which he is over other apostles. But that's when you start to see that come to the fore at Chalcedon. And then, uh, and these, you know, you kind of had these major cities, the Pentarchy, like Constantinople and, and Rome. And so even between the two of them, even at Chalcedon, you started to see the seeds of dissent grow between them. That was political, and they ended up splitting in the 11th century, but it was also theological over the Filioque controversy. And so I, I say that it was, it was that to a degree, but, it even, but also it was also genuinely theological at the same time, and we see that in this text, uh, in these texts that I've shown you, that um, you, don't, you, don't, you don't necessarily see uh, kind of a, at least stated, I mean, it was definitely there, but what we see stated in the, the writings of Timothy Elerus, Daniel Skatis, Abraham of Arshut is this sense in which they were motivated by the fact that they felt that the Chalcedonian church was perverting the gospel and that they were, they were defiling the incarnation in their, in their theological description of it. They felt that they were dividing Jesus in two. That's not what they were doing, but that's how they felt. And so that's really what their main motivation was. Um, but, uh, but yeah, but I do think the politics was a part of it. And of course, we need to, you know, today make sure that we uh, don't fall into those same traps. And we, you know, of course, we need to be socially and civically engaged, but uh, not in a way that's partisan, right? Because we understand that, uh, that in Christ, there is no, no Democrat or Republican. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.